Good afternoon. In the academic roster of IIT Kanpur, this course is named as TA101, Technical Arts 101. I am Anupam Saxena, an associate professor with mechanical engineering at IIT Kanpur. You know, science has come quite far. Na? About a couple of weeks ago, um, physicists were very excited, scientists were very excited that they were very close to discovering a particle called boson. The name comes from two scientists, uh, Bose and Einstein, and uh, this is the particle that uh, is responsible for matter. So, you have many intellectual minds, many intelligent minds working over matter. But how is this fact related to the course? Well, if you are pondering, never mind, it does not matter. Really? Never mind, it does not matter? Not quite. In this course, you will have to apply your mind, it does matter. For anything that you would do in engineering, you will have to apply your mind, you will have to apply your common sense because that is what matters in the end. So, this course is called Technical Arts 101, but I will slightly, I will give you a slightly different name. For me, this course is about thinking and analyzing. Think T and analyze A. But this is going to be slightly different in the sense that we are going to be thinking and analyzing only through geometry. No equations, no analysis, no deduction, but only through geometry, through drawings. Anybody have an idea what this picture is about? Do you know who this character is? You are right, he is Pooh, Winnie the Pooh. And he was conceived by two people. A. A. Milne and Ernst Schaeffer, that is what my 11 year old tells me, these are his friends. The point behind the picture, I will try to address this question as to how art got formalized over the years. You know long long very long time ago, but not so long ago, people expressed their ideas through sketches and paintings. They probably did not have the grammar, they did not have the vocabulary, they first of all started discussing or representing or expressing their ideas using sketches and paintings. Look at these paintings for instance, these are paintings from a place called Beam Betica, which is about close to Bhopal about 40, 45 kilometers, 60 kilometers close to Bhopal. Bhopal is about 8 and a half hours away from Kanpur, the city. You know, this place Bhim Betika has a lot of caves that were accessed by cave dwellers and it seems to have paintings from all these ages, Upper Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Paleolithic, Early Historic, Medieval. You know, so this stage here is about 50 to about 100,000 years ago, Mesolithic stage is about 10,000 years ago, Paleolithic is a stage where barter system came in existence primarily with agricultural commodities, early historic. So, if you look at these figures, you would realize that uh, people started sketching or painting schematic decorative in red, white and yellow and medieval stage was what is depicted by geometric linear manganese hematite redstone and use of wooden coal you know. So, these are paintings from a long time ago and if you look at these paintings, you would realize that there is no text, there is no grammar, there is no language, just art and pure art nothing else. You know like this quote here by Riva Kimball, long before words were written, thoughts were painted on the walls of the caves you know. So, again I would iterate that there was no language, there was no grammar all we could see were sketches that were painted in the walls of the caves. Well, some examples, look at some paintings, so this is from Sri Lanka from the 5th century. So, these are paintings from Ajanta caves again from the 5th century, these are paintings from ancient Egypt 5000 years ago, some from Shaway Caves, France 30,000 years ago, 
and these are from Tokipala Caves, Peru, about 6,000 years from now. You know, once again, coming back to this quote from Riva Kimball, long before words were written, thoughts were painted on the walls of the caves. Again, look at these paintings, no text, no grammar, no language, just art, just colors. Oh, of course, I mean, the text is here, the grammar is here, not inside the paintings. Keep that in mind. All right, so some more examples. These are a couple paintings from Pompeii, about 2,000 years, Pompeii, first century. Even some examples from China, the Tang Dynasty, 580 to 980. You know, so this was a phenomenon that was in existence throughout the world. Well, ancient times, the period of Renaissance, Sistine Chapel in Rome or in Vatican, I guess. Look at these paintings, absolutely fabulous, absolutely, absolutely fabulous. There are many number over there. Look at the use of colors, look at the details, you know, the features over here. So people really mastered art when they were at it. And look at these paintings over here on the roof and on the walls. Look at the curvature of the wall. The way they were able to use the curvature and represent paintings, amazing. Well, how about sculptures? People again were not behind. Again, this, uh, these are examples from the period of Renaissance. Again, sculptures from Rome. Pita over here, for instance. Look at again the details, you know, the muscles, the bones over here. People became very, very good at depicting not only their ideas in two dimensions, but also in three dimensions. You know, the question is, were they able to do all this without expressing anything on paper in two dimensions? They must be convinced, uh, they must be conceiving, you know, these ideas somewhere. Well, let's look at some examples of ancient monuments. You have the Colosseum from Rome, Pyramid from Egypt, Kutub Minar from Delhi, Lean Tower of Pizza, Taj Mahal over here. This is something which is very, very interesting. So this is um, um, a picture of Buddha. In fact, not a picture of Buddha, but a statue of Buddha. It's a wooden, largest wooden statue of Buddha in a place called Nara, Japan. You know, um, Golden Temple over here. Quite a few monuments from India, Asia, and worldwide. Once again, the question is, was it possible for us to have accomplished these monuments so nicely without using paper and pen or without conceiving these ideas beforehand. What would be your guess? My guess is definitely not. They must have worked quite a bit to be able to conceive these ideas. Well, so this are, or rather these are some examples from Gustave Eiffel. He was a French engineer, so these are engineering examples. Garabit Viaduct Railway, it's a bridge over here. Look at how efficiently he has been able to use frames to be able to provide enough strength for the rail to cross through this bridge. Railway station in Budapest, Maria Pier Bridge again. So if you look at this example and this example, very similar in construction. So there's this arch over here that is over the river and there are these vertical columns tapering upwards and there's a horizontal bridge supposed to be really stiff iron house in peru Eiffel tower one of the famous examples um, of engineering by gustav eiffel and his uh, company rather uh, his team again statue of liberty one in france the other one in the us close to new york you know, he and his company were responsible to be building about 65 buildings and bridges in Europe and elsewhere throughout the world. Once again, were they able to conceive these ideas? And these are, by the way, engineering ideas. I mean, a lot of these structures, they happen to be quite stiff. For example, these two guys, they happen to be quite stiff. Um, they are able to bear enormous, you know, 
vertical load. Here, uh, the Eiffel Tower is able to bear enormous wind load. You know, I was I was actually going through a few papers, and uh, I realized that, uh, or rather, uh, people talk about uh, this being um, conceived by two exponents or exponentials. So this is one exponential curve over here, the second exponential curve over here. Um, fantastic design. But again, he and his team members, they had to start with a paper and a pen. So they drew a lot of preliminary sketches, got the idea. And that's true for both the Eiffel Tower as well as the Statue of Liberty. So these are the internal skeletons, the sketches of internal skeletons of the Statue of Liberty. So people did work with paper and pen before they conceived all these, you know, now very well known engineering marvels. Bottom line, designers may have been a single person or a team of few or many. I don't know. Design had to be communicated to those building it what we now know as manufacturers you know so designers they would be communicating their design or their ideas to what we call manufacturers these days without that it is impossible communication could have been possible only through sketches or drawings you know that's the most efficient way in which i know i would be able to communicate my ideas to somebody else now the question is you know, I would draw a sketch or I would draw a few sketches in a different way. Uh, somebody else would draw these sketches in a different way. A third person, for example, if he looks at my sketch and if he looks at somebody else's sketch, um, is it possible for him to strike uniformity between these two ways of sketching? So the idea is, is there a way in which we can draw sketches so that it is easier for the manufacturers to understand these sketches. I will answer that question in a little while later, but first some more examples. Do you know who this guy is? None other than a very famous artist and engineer from Italy, Leonardo da Vinci. He was very, very talented, great artist and a great engineer, more than that a wonderful visionary. You know, what was something that I found surprising was his amazing way of describing, describing human anatomy. You know, look at the details of the sketches that he has over here, you know. I mean, of course, he's writing some notes over here, he's using some grammar, some language, but look at the details, you know, human face, typical human face look at the ratio that he is trying to work out, skull, human skull, a baby in a womb, I believe this is a picture that represents or that depicts the golden ratio, again uh, pictures of babies, fetus or feti, once again details over here, the anatomy, the bones. And not only did he work with anatomy, I mean he also worked with, um, um, he also used sketches to describe a lot of engineering components that uh, he came up with, the ideas that he came up with. You know, these are pictures from different machines. Uh, one of the flying machines that he had conceived around that time, 1500, 1600 maybe. Uh, I don't know what this is. Um, Again, a typical mechanical system, I believe. Again, a bunch of things over here. Typical mechanical system, a lot of pulleys and gears. You know, so there are many, many, plenty in number. Gear system. I guess a primitive glider that he conceived around that time. The many of these pictures that represent engineering, anatomy, medicine, you know, um, around the same time. And of course, he was an artist. So not only did he focus on the anatomy and engineering aspects, but 
he was also interested in art in beauty. And one of the final pictures that he that I would show you not not uh, from him. So, it is a single point perspective of a landscape probably inside of a hall if I am not mistaken yeah looks like it is. All right, so to be able to answer that question or to answer that question uh, that I had posed a little earlier was it possible for people to make the way we draw sketches more uniform. So, he was a person who made it possible his name is Gaspard Munger he was a French he was in French military he was an engineer you know born in 1746 uh, stayed on this earth till 1818. He is a person who is the inventor of descriptive geometry you know picture sketches were used around that time to communicate, but did not have any uniformity. So, that is what he started off with one could draw figures in various ways one could draw painting sketches in various ways yes we all know that architects builders engineers designers they had tremendous difficulty in understanding these figures. I mean fine I mean if um, I let us say I draw something over here it is you know if I draw something like this perhaps it is not very difficult for you to identify what this is it is a cube for instance or if I draw something here for instance this would be a pyramid with a square base. So, these are sketches that you know people would understand, but how about the dimensions ok. How about relative lengths or angles for that matter. So, these are things that you know manufacturers architects builders engineers designers they would use to be able to you know accomplish what this sketch would stand for or what this sketch would stand for right. So, these are details which were not present in those sketches. Munger formalized the technical drawings what we know as orthographic projections. Uh, the first few lectures will actually be dedicated to these projections and we will learn more about them and other projections or other ways of representing different solids or different drawings later in this course. The scheme was quickly adopted by army engineers you know first in France and then worldwide and after the war it was accepted worldwide and formed the backbone for industrial revolution. You know look at the buildings we have around us look at the engineering marvels the cars the trains the bullet trains the aircrafts existence of all of which probably would not have been possible unless we had our drawings or sketches being represented uniformly. So, the objective in this course is to learn technical drawing in theory as well as in practice using grafting tools and freehand sketches. Once again the objective is to learn technical drawing or technical art in theory and practice using grafting tools and freehand sketches and we will do that you know in the next 40 hours that we will devote to this course. All right, so this is the organization lectures and laboratory assignments that uh, we have planned um, week one. Essentially, we'll have two lectures on introduction and basic construction. Week two, again, two lectures on orthographic projections. Week three, two lectures on orthographic projections. Week four, on isometric projections. Week five, on missing lines and views. Week six, on sections and assembly. Week seven on oblique projections you know cavalier and cabinet week 8 on perspective projections week 9 and 10 four lectures over here on lines and planes week 11 
will be on auxiliary projections, week 12 and week 13 will be devoted to the topics in section of lines, planes and solids and in section and development. So, in all we will have about 26 lectures and we will have about 13 labs. So, each lab will be of 3 hour each. So, a lot of work that lies ahead of us. All right. So, lectures will be held in L7 on two days, Tuesday and Thursday from 2 to 3 p.m. Labs will be held in drawing hall, which is the extension of the Northern Lab, and we will probably have one or two labs on AutoCAD, which will be held in the new IME building on the third floor. All right, so your class is divided into 12 groups of I would say 40 students each on an average B1, B2 and B3 they will be doing the labs on Tuesday. Tutors are Professor Shakti Singh Gupta, Professor N. N. Kishore and Mr. Shantanu. The first two from the mechanical engineering, the second from or rather third from aeronautical engineering. B4, B5, B6 they will do the labs on Monday. And you will have Professor Tare, Professor Bose and Professor or rather Mr. Bharadwaj as your respective tutors. Sections B7, B8 and B9 are planned for Wednesday with Tarun Gupta, Basundalal Sharma and Ashish Datta from Civil and Mechanical Engineering and B10 to B12 they will be doing the labs on Thursday with Rajiv Sinha, Javed Malik and Ria Catherine George all from Civil Engineering. The grading policy you know since you are going to be working a lot in your labs um, we have decided that we will assign about 25 percent of your grade to your labs your lab work. Home assignments you will be doing them quite a bit so 10 percent for that. Mid semester examination 25 percent end semester examination 40 percent. So, 25 plus 25 50 10 plus 40 50 overall 100 percent and there would be certain extra credit assignments that I may be giving that will add to it. Okay. So, just in case if um, you are doing better than what you are or what you what what rather what you are then of course, you will be expecting or you may expect you know more than 100 percent marks and that will be that will be pretty interesting that will be pretty nice. Okay, so, the lecture notes are going to be hosted on my web page home.iitk.ac.in slash tilde anupam s under courses in the main menu and uh, this is listed under course 2 TA 101 is listed in course 2. We will have a manual for lab and home assignments. Um, you know you can seek or you can buy drawing material and books essentially a 3 sheets, a 4 sheets, sketchbook, grid book pretty much like that from Noble Bookstore or Thun Bookstore in the IT campus. And we will be using primarily two books as our text French, Pierrick and Foster graphic science and design published by Tata McGraw Hills 2012 and another book by N. D. Putt on elementary engineering drawing. Karotar Publishing Anand I think this is in Gujarat is it 31st edition 1990. So, two books that we will be using. Equipment required you will probably not be able to do your drawings without these equipments. So, this is a mini drafter here a set of set squares this I think is a 45 45 90 another one uh, 60 30 90 you will have a bunch of erasers. What I recommend is a 0.5 lead pencil. So, you will be doing some construction lines and you will be doing some main lines for the construction lines I usually use and recommend 2 H pencil or 2 H lead and for the drawing I recommend H lead a pencil uh, that helps avoid you know spoiling of sheet just in case if I have to use the eraser. One thing I also recommend is the use of this stencil full of circles you know for smaller circles it is a lot easier and lot neater 
for all of us to draw circles using this stencil. Otherwise for larger circles you will have a compass and for weird looking curves you might want to use a set of French curves you know to connect the dots and give them a smooth render. So all these should be available either with Noble Bookstore or Thurman Bookstore in the campus. Now a few things which I would actually want you to note which are very important. All labs are to be done in A3 drawing sheets unless specified otherwise. All homeworks again in A3 drawing sheets unless specified otherwise and all sketches in sketchbook. It is always a nice idea to come prepared for your subsequent lab and you know working out your sketches in a sketchbook would be a nice idea. So that way you will not be wasting a lot of time you know scratching your head looking left right rather you would know what you need to do in your lab if you adhere to this third point. Okay, so let us get started with some theory we will draw some perpendiculars to and from a line what kind of methods to be used for that. Well so let us take a case where a point is not on a line. So you have line L you have a point somewhere here not on the line okay, and you would like to draw a perpendicular from that point onto that line. Okay, so let that point be Q you know the easiest thing that you would do is you would place a ruler with one of the edges on the line and then you will take a set square okay, with one of the edges on the ruler. So this would be I guess a 30 90 or a 45 45 set square and you would place the other edge of the set square so that it virtually passes to this point and then you would draw this line you know this is how okay, not very difficult straightforward. Yeah, all right. So another case we have a line here a point here rather it is a similar case but in this case let us see if uh, we do not use a ruler and a set square what do we or how do we draw a perpendicular perhaps just using a compass let us see. So you know so we will take a compass we will measure this distance and with radius larger than this distance we will draw an arc which would be cutting this line at two points point here and point here. Okay. So this is the radius r which is greater than this distance okay. and from this point over here okay, we will draw another arc that is going to be cutting this arc let us say let us say this radius is r1 which I think is slightly larger than the distance this distance over here and with the same radius r1 okay, we are going to be making another arc. Okay. Now what we will be having is this point over here and if we join this point with point q this red line will be perpendicular to the line in question. So this was the case where we had used a ruler and a set square this is an identical case where we did not use these geometrical entities rather we only use a compass. These are you know um, things that uh, you probably remember from the grade school. Okay, point on a line. So the previous case was when the point was not on the line what if the point is on the line what do you do in this case. So line L a point on line L Q so you are going to be drawing an arc with radius R1 again you will be drawing another arc on the other side of the line again with radius r1 with radius r2 or r and center this point you could be 
we are going to be drawing an arc here and again the same thing. So, with this as center and radius as r. So, this r I think would be slightly larger than r 1 or maybe a little more larger than r 1 okay. and the intersection point over here if you join this point with point q you are going to be having a line in red perpendicular to the line in green. Line L point on the line okay. let us say we have another point C which is not on the line. Okay. We take this distance R distance CQ and we draw a large arc with C a center. Let that arc cut the line at point A. I would join point A and C and I would probably extend it to intersect with the arc over here. Let me call that intersection point as M okay. and M is such that if I draw a line joining M and Q this line is going to be perpendicular to the original line L. Try to prove this again. So, this course is about thinking and analyzing. So, whatever constructions we have discussed so far go back to your hostel rooms and try to work it out algebraically whether really all these red lines in different cases happen to be perpendicular to green lines. I am sure the proof is or the proofs rather are not very difficult. Arc tangents to lines and arcs. Okay. So, we have line L, we have a point Q, well, let us say we draw a perpendicular from Q to L, you know actually you have studied four cases just about now how to draw perpendiculars to a line. Let this distance be r that is pretty straightforward you know. So, just take a compass take q as center this as radius draw an arc straightforward. Okay, about this one line l oh that is a big circle all right. So, we have a center for that circle let us call that center C. Okay, so, let us let this circle have radius r 1 okay. all right. So, what are we doing here I guess we are looking for an arc which is common to this circle and the line all right. So, let us see how we do that let us take any point on the line and draw an arc you know of radius r. Let us draw a line parallel to this line L you know tangent to this arc okay. Let us call this line L prime. Now, with C as center and the radius as r 1 plus r okay let us draw an arc that cuts this dashed line L prime here. Okay. Now, with this as center it is possible for us to draw an arc which is tangent to both the circle and the line and of course, this arc is of radius r. So, I guess the problem was you know given a line and a circle and uh, given a number r how do we draw an arc of radius r that is tangent to both the circle and the line. So, this is how we draw that clearly this distance is r. Okay, so, we have a point we have a circle Oh, let us say we have an arc we have another arc here. So, the first arc has a center and radius r 1 the second arc has a center and radius r 2. Okay. So, 
So, this arc with this as center if we draw this arc of radius r 1 plus r and with this as center if we draw another arc of radius r 2 plus r okay, then we will get this center over here and with this center it will be possible for us to draw an arc of radius r which is tangent to both these circles. So, the problem here was you know given a circle with center here radius r 1 another circle or arc with center here radius r 2 and a number r how do you draw an arc which is tangent to both these circles. So, this is what the solution is once again all right. So, this is the problem given draw an arc with this as center and radius r 1 plus r draw an arc with this as center and radius r 2 plus r you know get the intersection points of these two arcs right over here with this as center and radius as r draw an arc that is tangent to both these circles. You know how about solving this problem in a slightly different manner again. So, given two arcs with the respective centers and radius r 1 r 2 ok. Now, draw an arc with this as center and radius r minus r 1. So, r is given to us let us say and draw another arc with this as center and radius r minus r 2. So, with this as intersection point the center and with radius r it is possible for you to draw an arc with this tangent to both these arcs, but you know this would actually be encompassing both these circles. So, you know slightly different angle to the same problem of course, this radius is r which is larger than r 1 and larger than r 2. All right, so given line L and L prime um, you know take any point on this line draw an arc of radius r draw a line which is parallel to this line you know with any point over here on line L prime draw an arc of radius r and draw a line parallel to this line. Okay, so, you will actually be having these two dashed lines intersecting at some point and with this point as center and the radius r it is possible for you to draw an arc which is tangent to both these lines. You know these are constructs or constructions that you are very well aware of from your grade school. Line and angle bisectors again so this is something that you probably have learned in the 8th or ninth grade or even earlier. So, given a line ok. So, draw this arc where this is center and radius slightly larger than half the length of this line and vice versa you know with this as center the same radius draw this arc over here. Um, if you join these two points this essential or this line would essentially be bisecting this line into two parts. So, it is actually going to be a perpendicular bisector it is probably not very clear through this figure, but that is how it is going to be. Again so, these two lines with this as center draw an arc. So, this arc is going to be intersecting this line and this line in these two points with the same radius or maybe a different radius I guess uh, with this as center draw an arc with this as center draw an arc I guess it has to be the same center go back to your grade spoon and figure this thing out. So, the intersection point between these two arcs would actually give you a point. So, if you join what am I saying. So, so the intersection of these two arcs will give you a point and if you join this point with this point the result essentially will be a line that will be an angular bisector defined by these two lines. So, essentially this angle will be the same as this angle. How about trisection? So, given a line 
you know draw another line over here could be of any angle. Divide this line into three parts three equal parts you know. So, this length this length and this length they are the same join the end point of this segment with the original segment okay. and you know draw these lines parallel to this line. And essentially, these points will ensure that this line gets trisected, divided into three equal parts. Can we do the same thing for this angle? Let's say yeah, it so happens that uh, using a ruler and a compass, it's impossible for you to trisect this angle. But there's something called a multiplicator or an angle price sector it is a mechanical device that looks like this. Okay. So, if you essentially have this link so it is actually a linkage you know. So, if you have this link placed on one of the edges of this angle and this link placed on the other edge. Okay it is possible for you to trisect the angle. I am sorry if you place this link on this edge and if you place this link on this edge. So, these two links will essentially be giving you the lines over here and over here in such a way that this angle is going to be divided into three equal parts. So, it is called an angle multiplicator a mechanical linkage that was initially conceived by A B Kempe. All right, so I will stop now um, and I would request you to keep thinking and analyzing. So, we will come back in the next lecture.